Welcome again. In this session, we're going to be reading Mark chapter 14. When Jesus was anointed at Bethany, we're going to be talking about the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. We're going to be talking about how Jesus predicted Peter's denial, Gethsemane, Jesus arrested, and Peter's denial. Let's start at verse 1. It was now two days before the feast of the Passover and the unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might seize him by deception and kill him. Again, I find it very interesting that the chief priests, the religious people, would want to seize somebody by deception. Hmm. Verse 2. For they said, not during the feast, because there might be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Shimon the leper, As he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster jar of ointment of pure nard, very costly. She broke the jar and poured it over his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves, saying, Why has this ointment been wasted? For this might have been sold for more than 300 denarii. So 300 denarii was about a year's wages for an agricultural labor. Think about it. a year's wages, okay? Think about what is a year's, a year's wages to you? That's how much this perfume was worth, and that's how much she poured over Jesus' head. So it says here, you know, uh, that uh, some were indignant, some were very angry. Some of the disciples were very angry, saying, Why, you know, has this ointment been wasted? For this might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. So they grumbled against her. Okay. Now, once again, I just want to interject here. In uh, in another gospel, you will read that uh, there is one particular disciple uh, that was very angry, and that was Judas. The reason why he was angry at this so-called waste is because uh, he was a thief and he was also the treasurer. So he would have thought to himself, "Oh, you know, a hun- you know, a whole year's wages. I could have really got a, I could have really dipped my hand in that and got a good cut from there. You know, I could have got, I could have got a whole lot of money. I, I lost, a, I lost a whole lot of money. I lost an opportunity to get a whole lot of, to steal a whole lot of money here." So why I should have been given to the poor? Verse 6. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you always have the poor with you, and when and whenever you want, you can do them good. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burying. Wow. Like he is got death in mind here that he knows he's going to be delivered up and be, to be crucified. Most certainly, I tell you, wherever this good news, gospel, may be preached throughout the whole world, that which this woman has done will, be, will also be spoken of her for a memorial of her. Now, I want to make this very clear. And I did so also... Uh, I, said, I talked about this in the uh, when I was going through the book of Matthew, but I just want to quickly talk about it now. Again, you should look, you should listen to all of the teachings, listen to all of the uh, the readings here to get a f- more fuller picture here. But you see now in the scriptures, there is the idea: if you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. Uh, there's in in the apocrypha actually, uh, there is specific instance where it talks about if you give to the poor it will be like a mem- it will come up as a memorial in your name before God okay that is also in the book of acts you know we talk about cornelius his alms his uh, giving to the poor and his prayers were were uh, his prayers were heard and he his name basically came up before God as a memorial because of his alms giving so you need to understand the whole mindset here the whole the whole setting here. Now, in the whole setting, and we know that again, in all everything in context here, the Septuagint was already written at this time, which included all of the apocrypha that the Roman Catholic Church uses, 
and the Orthodox Church uses, by the way, which is more than the more books they they include than the Catholic uh, Church does. But that was in the Septuagint in these days, and that was considered scripture, okay, by you know a lot of people. Okay, so this is the idea: give to the poor you will be remembered before God. You, your name will come up as a memorial. This is why, and this is what a lot of people don't clue in on, okay? This is why Jesus linked the two together. When they said, you could have sold this perfume for, you know, a year's wages and, and given to the poor. And so the unspoken thing here is that it could have been uh, you know, give it to the poor and your name will be brought up as a memorial. So the unspoken key buzzword here that wasn't, again, it wasn't explicitly spoken, but in context, in culture, according to the scriptures, memorial here was involved. So Jesus is like, no, no, no. Don't think that this woman has lost her memorial, okay? Because she poured this over my head because what she has done, even though she didn't give to the poor, she will still get her memorial because everywhere the gospel is preached, her, uh, what she has done will be spoken of as a memorial for her. Okay? You understand? There's a big link here between almsgiving, memorial. Almsgiving, memorial. Okay? That's why Jesus linked in this memorial thing here because he says, no, 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 you, you need to understand. Uh, just because she didn't give this to the poor doesn't mean she loses her memorial. Verse 10, Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went away to the chief priest. Now, let me talk, let me stop right here. Now, the theory is here that the whole thing about the perfume being spilt on Jesus' head, poured out, wasted, so-called, on Jesus' head, was the straw that broke the camel's back in the mind of Judas. He, at this point in time, he was angry. He, I'm losing lots of money here. I could have stole lots of money here, like I always steal money here. I, you know, and so he's angry at Jesus. So now he's trying to, with this chip on his shoulder, he's going away thinking about betrayal. Okay, turning him over to the, to the, to the powers that be, to the authorities. So Judas Iscariot, Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went away to the chief priests. Again, triggered by this alabaster jar of ointment, so-called wasted. Okay, that's what that's what triggered him. That he might deliver him to them. So he's he's there to betray, to in I guess you would call it in more of a street language, to rat him off. Verse eleven. They, when they heard it, were glad. Of course. You know, the authorities are always, oh, it's a good thing you told us. Oh, it's very good that you tell us this stuff. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, you don't know how much good you're doing here. Oh, you know, you're helping out a lot here. And what you're doing is a good thing, Judas. When they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. Not only is it really good that you did this, Jesus, uh, Judas, but uh, we're going to pay you for it. We're going to give you money He sought how he might conveniently deliver him. On the first day of unleavened bread, so this would be the first day of Passover, more or less, uh, when they sacrificed the Passover, his disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? Now, let me stop here again. There are some people who believe that Jesus was crucified before the Passover. Not so. And they, one of their biggest... Um, one of their biggest arguments is, you know, Jesus said as, you know, Jonah spent uh, three days in the, in the heart of the fish, so the Son of Man will spend three days in the heart of the earth. Uh, so then if he rose on Sunday, then he must have been crucified on Thursday. So Thursday is a whole day, Friday is a whole day, and Saturday is a whole day. What you need to understand is in the Jewish mindset and in the culture, again, the culture and context, okay, culturally speaking, contextually speaking here, even if you even a part of a day, even a few hours of that of a specific day is considered to be a day, is counted as a day, okay? So, you know, 
I remember being a child and, you know, my mother said, oh, you know, after going to preschool and then you know, once you go to, you know, you know, regular school, you know, you're going to be there all day. And I'm thinking, all oh, day? Like, that's like, you know, like, it's like a 24-hour day. Oh, my, I'm, I'm losing everything here. I'm losing, I'm not even going to live at home anymore. I'm going to be there all day. And that's the way some of these Christians think when it comes to Jesus saying, oh, you know, three days in the heart of the fish, Jonah was, so he will be three days and three nights, or whatever you might say, or however you might call it, in the heart of the earth, okay? So you got to understand that days or nights are not considered to be like a mathematical calculation here. It is just, it could be, a half an hour of that day. It could be, a, 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 you know, a couple hours or half of a day it would be counted as a day. They don't look at it as fractions of a day, okay? So this was the first the first day of unleavened bread. Jesus has not been crucified yet. This would have been, you know, this would have been like a Friday or something like that, Friday evening, uh, when they sacrificed the Passover. Uh, his disciples came, uh, asked him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and there a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters in, tell the master of that house, the teacher, a rabbi, says, Where is the guest room where, I'm, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He himself will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Get ready for us there. So why would his, and you know, again, there's a lot of Christians who say that Jesus didn't really eat, didn't really eat the Passover. You know, it was the, it was the meal of the firstborn or whatever it was, you know, that he didn't really have the Passover. He didn't really uh, eat the Passover, the, that the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, um, the Lord's Table was not the real Passover. Well, if that's the case, why would Jesus send them in and say, I will eat the Passover. Prepare for me. I'm coming. He could have said, I'm not going to eat the Passover. Oh, sorry, guys, this year is a, is a, is a very, uh, you know, um, extraordinary year. And uh, I'm not going to be eating the Passover with you guys this year. He could have just said that. He, he could have just said, don't worry about it this time. This year is different. It's a different year. But no, he made, you know, uh, uh, he took. He went to great effort to uh, to prepare for the Passover. Verse sixteen. His disciples went out and came into the city and found things just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. As they sat and were eating, Jesus said, "Most certainly I tell you, one of you will will betray me, who eats with me." They began to be sorrowful and to ask him, and to ask him one by one, surely not I. And another said, surely not I. So they were like, not I, not I, not I, all 12 of them. And he answered, it is one of the 12 who he who dips with me in the dish. Again, this is a Passover tradition. OK, if you know of the Jewish uh I, it's hard for me to say Jewish because Passover is not Jewish. It is the Lord's feast. But if you know the, how they did it, th there would be a dish that they would dip in, okay? Even to this day, um, Jews who celebrate the Passover and all Gentiles that celebrate the Passover, they celebrate it correctly, they dip into a dish. Verse 21, For the Son of Man goes, even as, even as it is written of, about him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had not been born. Once again, Jesus calls down woe, which is the opposite of blessing. Okay, this is a curse. He, he doesn't say, he's not like a, a lot of people say, oh, Jesus is just like a hippie that just hugs every tree and blesses everybody and kisses everybody that goes by. Not at all. He pronounced a lot of woes, a lot of cursing, a lot of harsh things to a lot of people, okay? In fact, he might, he might even be, <laughs> well, accused of, if not, uh, you know, brought up on a lot of hate crimes today, okay? It's just that ridiculous. That, that, that's how ridiculous it is today, that even the Lord of glory, the, the sinless one, would be, would be, would be uh, 
considered to be a criminal. That's how bad it is. Okay, so um, yeah. So he called down woes, cursing on the man that would betray him. And he says something very harsh, something that he never said even to the sons of Satan. Remember he was talking to the people in John chapter 8. He called them more or less sons of Satan. He called people sons of hell, sons of, you know, a brood of vipers. You're a family of snakes. You're like whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside. You look all pretty on the outside, but on the inside you're full of filthy, stinking, dead, rotten flesh. Um... He said a lot of harsh things to a lot of people, but this one, speaking in regards to Judas, he said, it would be better for that man if he had not been born. Wow. That's harsh. That's hard. That's serious. Verse 22. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it. And when he had blessed, he broke it and gave to them and said, take, eat. This is my body. <gasps> body. Hmm. Really? He took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it, he gave to them. And they all drank it. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Most certainly, I tell you, I will no more drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in God's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn. Okay, now let me stop right here in verse 25. I said this before. I'll say it again. Jesus was accused of being a wine bibber. Key word here is accused. Alleged. Okay. And I know somebody say, what might say, well, he said that John the Baptist came neither e eating nor, nor drinking. They said he had a, uh, you know, they said that he had a devil. But the Son of Man comes and eating and drinking, and he says that he's a wine bibber and a glutton. Okay. Now we know that Jesus was not a glutton, and if you look at it in context, we know that he was not a wine bibber either. Okay. There is no evidence, no explicit evidence anywhere in scripture that he even drank grape juice let alone wine let me explain in the book of numbers there's a thing called the nazarite vow this is how it goes okay if you, there are different levels to holiness okay especially if you're a gentile if you're a gentile you come in and there's what they call the norchide laws which is the, basically an introduction to the Torah. This is where you start at. This is your starting step, okay? You're, you're, this is the first step to knowing more and obeying more of Torah. As you learn more of Torah, you obey more of the, of the law of God. As you learn more about God's ways, you follow more of God according to His righteousness. Not your righteousness, but His righteousness. There, there's the key, okay? Your righteousness is what you think is right and wrong. God's righteousness is what He thinks is right and wrong. Okay, you need to fall into God's righteousness, which means you obey his law according to doing, you know, do what is right in his eyes, basically. OK, so there are those who are Torah observant, who are Torah, I want to say compatible, compliant. Um, but then if there is like there's like the penthouse of holiness, there's like the ep the epitome of of spirituality. There's like the, the the epitome of obedience, holiness, dedication, and sacrifice. And that is the Nazarite vow. Okay? So for those of you for those who there are some people that were that were it was mandatory for them to be uh, you know to be under the Nazarite vow all of their life. Some people not. Some people it's optional. Uh and it's more or less up to you for how long you want to be you want to place yourself under this vow. One of the one of the stipulations of this vow is that you don't eat any grapes or you don't drink any grape juice or anything from the fruit of the vine, even grape seeds or grape skin, nothing like that. Okay. My point is this: Why would Jesus not take the Nazarite vow? Okay. Why would he not? Another stipulation of the Nazarite vow is that you're supposed to have longer hair. You let your hair grow out. A man let his hair grow out. Okay. Now we all know that uh, there, it's the traditional view that Jesus had long hair, and uh, from early um, 
from ancient documents and, and uh, you know, extra biblical sources uh, dated from around that time that there is, it, they do describe Jesus as having long hair. So here we've got at the, at the Lord's table, at the Last Supper, we got Jesus refusing to drink the, the grape juice. We also got him with long hair. What does that tell you? Why would he not take the Nazarite vow? Why would he not take the extra step of, of, that, of holiness? Why not? He's supposed to be the most holy man that ever lived, and, and indeed he is. So I believe that he was under the Nazarite vow from conception, okay, until death. That's why he said, I'm not going to drink this with you until the day I drink it anew in God's kingdom, okay? So in the future, but not now. Um, again, there's not much detail here. It doesn't get, it doesn't, t- it doesn't say why. So you just got to actually, you got to read, you got to figure it out yourself. You got to know the culture, the context. Um, you got to know the scriptures. Okay. So there you go. Verse 26. When they had sung a hymn, uh, and this brings me another, uh, another point here. The question is, wouldn't it be, Really interesting to know what hymn they sung. What song did they sing? How did they sing it? Did they use instruments? Did they clap? Did they just go out and do it a cappella? How would that sound? How did they sing it? What style of music were they into? Um, they had sung a hymn, it says here. Now, in if you were to walk into a church today, most churches, uh, the older churches would have hymn books. The newer churches would have a repertoire of their worship music or worship choruses. And I almost pretty much guaranteed, pretty much you can go to the bank on it, that the worship music that more contemporary churches sing is contemporary Christian praise and worship. Uh, The the worship, so-called worship music or the hymns that older churches uh, sing is from a traditional hymn book. But back in those days, back in the days of the Bible, back in the days of Jesus, when he was walking the earth in the flesh like this, the hymns were the Psalms. The Psalms, okay? Today, being as corrupt as we are, we take a verse here, a passage here, a little bit of a psalm here. We take a few verses out of a psalm, out of one of the psalms here. We take a, we take a quarter of a psalm here. We take one little sentence or one little phrase of a song of a psalm here. We write a hymn about it. We write a contemporary Christian praise and worship song about it. And we make it sound all flowery. Praise the Lord. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Hallelujah. But most psalms are much more meaty than that. They have in it how much God hates sin, how much God wants you to repent, how much God uh, is, you know, is calling you to righteousness. You know, uh, the, the, the woes, of the toils of life, the hardships of life is all in the psalms. You don't hear that in much in contemporary praise and worship anymore. What do we do? We butcher the word of God. We, we, um, picking, we're cherry picking. Yeah. We're cherry picking the scriptures. We're cherry picking. Can you imagine going to a work, a place of employment and, and looking at the rules on the board or looking at the, you know, or, you know, the boss tells you a whole lot of stuff what to do. And you say, well, I like that one thing. It's a pretty little thing. I'm going to go by that, but I'm not going to listen to anything else. How far are you going to get? You're going to be out the door pretty fast. Um, and so that's the way it is in God's kingdom. Take it all or not at all. When you sing a hymn, you should sing the whole psalm. Not just the pretty stuff. When they had sung a hymn, which was almost certainly one of the Psalms, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Olives. Key word there. I'll I'll get back to that. Verse 27. 
Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me tonight, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That's in Zechariah who? Or Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. However, after I am raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said to him, Although all will be offended, yet I will not. Offended here meaning all will fall away, all will go and will will leave you, will be will more or less fall into sin or whatever you might call it. Although all would, I will not. Jesus said to him, first of all, let me just stop here. Whenever someone speaks up and it makes himself sound like he's so good, oh yeah, I would never betray you. I would never leave you. You know, you know, there's a saying, never say never. I know of a good friend of mine who I can take you right to the spot where he said it. He's like, I have already made a, a, a more or less a pact with my wife. We never even use the word divorce. Never. It's not in our vocabulary. It's never used in our house. That word is never even spoken of in our house. He bragged about it. Within no time, he was divorced. Jesus bragged about it. Although all will be offended, yet I will not be offended. I will not be. Jesus said, most certainly I tell you. Before I, before I get into this, a little warning for those of you who want a tip, tidbit of wisdom here. Be careful of those who always like to speak well of themselves. Like, them, like to show themselves to know more, to be more loyal or more, you know. Be careful of the ones that are smiley all the time. The ones who are always hugging. These ones that are just so overly sweet, okay. Be careful. I find that a lot of times the ones who are nasty are the ones that are more trustworthy. Uh, the ones that don't s greet you with a smile all the time are, the, are some of the ones who are more of your friend than the aforementioned. So Jesus said, most certainly I tell you, Peter, you bragging about that you're never going to leave me, you're never going to fall away, that you today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will be you will deny me three times. Three times. Ouch. But he spoke all the more. If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same thing. They came to a place which is called which is which was named Gethsemane. Now, this is why I said, remember they went they came to the Mount of Olives. Okay, the, the name Gethsemane here means olive press. This is where they make the olive oil. The word Christ or Messiah, Hebrew Mashiach, means anointed one. Speaking of oil. Okay, oil. Gethsemane is a place where they make oil. The olive press. You cannot get oil without being pressed hard. Okay? Without being crushed, you're not going to get oil. In this place, indeed, Jesus was crushed. He said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter, James, and John. Again, Peter, James, and John get exclusive access to the inner of the inner circles of the Lord, and began to be greatly troubled and distressed. He said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went, to, he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that even if, if it were possible, the hour might pass away from him. He said, Abba. Okay. In the notes here, Abba is a Greek, is a Greek spelling for an Aramaic word for father or daddy used in a familiar, respectful, and loving way. Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Please remove this cup from me. However, not what I desire, but what you desire. What's the cup? The cup is the cup of suffering. The cup of persecution, the cup of crucifixion. He came, for, he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Couldn't you watch one hour? 
Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You want to, but you are just, your flesh is too weak. How often do I sometimes think to myself, you know, spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, let's look at this word hour. Simon, you are sleep. Are you st- are you sleeping? Couldn't you watch one hour? Now, again, a lot of Christians would say, when Jesus said an hour, he means an hour, as in sixty minutes of sixty seconds. The word hour, in uh, in 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 this context again, in this culture, in this way of of speaking, is doesn't mean a sixty minutes time frame. Okay, it means. It means a moment of time, okay? So if you think that it might still, if, for those of you who are, not, who are not buying what I'm saying, if you think it means a 60-minute hour, uh, do you think that he actually went through, it, it says here in verse 20, uh, 35, he went forward a little and fell to the ground. Okay, he didn't walk for an hour or half an hour. He went forward a little. Okay, as in a few steps, and walked and fell to the ground and prayed. Okay, and he prayed a what a, a two three sentence prayer, and then he came back. That doesn't take an hour. Okay, and now some of you might be might be saying, "Oh, well, it was a lot more than what's recorded." Well, it could have been, but I don't think he spent a whole hour, sixty minute hour praying. I think that it was a part a fraction of an hour okay Uh, the exact minutes again who knows um verse 38 watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation the speed the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak again he went away and prayed this saying the same words again he returned and found them sleeping for their eyes were very heavy and they didn't know what to answer him He came the third time and said to them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. He knew they're coming. Arise, let's get going. Look, behold, he who betrays me is at hand. At hand again means is close, near, right there, almost right there. Okay. In verse 43, immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came uh, with him a, uh, a multitude with, with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now he, ha- he who betrayed him had given them a sign, saying, saying, Whomever I kiss, that is he. Be careful of those who are just extra sweet with you, okay? Seize him and lead him away safely. When he had come, immediately he came to him and said, Rabbi, Rabbi! Rabbi means my teacher, my teacher. And kissed him. Oh, how sweet. How sweet the betrayal was. Or should I say how deceptive and how hypocritical it was. Verse 46. They laid their hands on him and seized him. But a certain one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Jesus answered them, Have you come out against a as against a robber with swords and clubs to seize me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you didn't arrest me. But this is so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Verse 50, They all left him and fled. A certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around himself over his naked body. The young men grabbed him, but he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Verse 53, they led Jesus away to the high priest. All the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes came together with him. I suppose, you know, that these people would think that they're doing right, that they're doing good in doing this to Jesus, because after all, we're, it's the will of the high priest. That we're delivering him to the high priest. It's like, it's like saying, oh, I'm going to take someone to pastor so-and-so, to the priest, to the bishop. To the Pope, to the high priest. Oh, the high priest, it must be good. So many people mistaken church 
for God's will. Everything that happens in church is God's will. Everything, you know, all, everybody that goes to church is right, is good with God. Verse 54, Peter had followed him from a distance until he came into the court of the high priest. He was sitting with the officers and warming himself in the light of the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council sought witness against Jesus to put him to death. They sought witness, okay? They arrested him without any witnesses and found none. They couldn't find any. They had a hard time here. For many false witness or false for many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony didn't agree with each other. Hmm, we're trying so hard to find something to get the, to get Jesus on because we hate him so much. Why? It's like today. A lot of people hate people for absolutely no reason. Absolutely no reason. Because they're because they preach righteousness. Because they stand for righteousness. Because they're holy. Verse 57. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build, I will build another made without hands. Even so, their testimony didn't agree. The high priest stood, in the, uh, stood up in the middle and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that these testify against you? But he stayed quiet and answered nothing. And this is like what they say, like the sheep led to the slaughter is silent. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of the sky. The high priest tore his clothes. It's like, ah, like just totally, just in protest, in sorrow, just tore his clothes and said, what further need uh, uh, have we of witnesses? You have heard the, the blasphemy, blasphemy. What do you think? You know, what made the high priest so angry here? Okay, again, in context, according to the culture, you will see that one of the books that is not so popular today in, in certain circles is the Book of Enoch. But we know back in those days, it was uh, a book that has been read and considered to be authentic scripture by by uh, officials, by uh, spiritual leaders, okay? And they were, it was also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. By the way, Jesus said a lot of things against a lot of doctrines, but he never said anything against the doctrine of the book of Enoch, and we know it existed in his day, uh, in, his, uh, in his area, you know, more or less. So, yeah. If you know the book of Enoch, you know that when Jesus said, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of the sky, that Jesus was referring to the Mashiach as per book of Enoch. The high priest knew that. That's why he tore his clothes, okay? This is the thing. You see, a lot of people don't understand when they read a lot of things that Jesus said, a lot of things that the apostles said, a lot of things that even Paul said is from the book of Enoch. A lot of things, in the, especially the book of Hebrews, is, is right directly from the book of, he, uh, of Enoch. How do I know? Because it's just, it's almost, you know, a direct quote of it. it, it you don't have to have book, chapter, verse uh, referenced in, in order to understand that it's what it's from, where they get it from. And back in those days, they didn't quote book, chapter, verse like they did today. In fact, I don't even, I, as far as I know, they didn't even have chapters and verses uh, separated out back in those days. That was done later on. Okay, so um, it's like this. Today, if I said, Romeo, Romeo, where art, where art thou, Romeo? Everybody would know I'm quoting from Shakespeare. I don't have to quote, I don't have to say, oh, as Shakespeare said in this book, in this chapter and verse. No, all I got to do is say, Romeo, Romeo, where art thou, Ro uh, Romeo? You know what I'm talking about. You know where, I, where I'm getting that from. In the same way, when, when a lot of things that Jesus said, a lot of things the, the disciples said, a lot of things you know, the prophet said, a lot of things that the Bible says, 
you know where it comes from because you understand the culture that the Book of Enoch was there, you know, as part of the foundation of, of the doctrine in that day. And we have proof of that in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But once again, that is another whole topic, okay? So, uh, but I did do want to put that bug in your ear. Verse uh, 64, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him to be worthy of death. It doesn't say that anybody stood up for him uh, for his life. Why, why would, they, would they be so angry with him? Why would this, so many people be so angry with him? Well, Jesus said it in the book of John. He said, the world hates me. Oh, isn't he such a lovable guy, a loving guy? Jesus said, the world hates me because I testify that its deeds are evil. Evil. Jesus was like a street preacher preaching that their deeds were evil. That's why they hated him. They loved darkness more than they liked, they loved the light. Verse 65, some began to spit on him, cover his face and beat him with their fists and tell him, prophesy. The officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Good officers, aren't they? Or not. As Peter was in the courtyard below, excuse me, one of the maids of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you were also with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, neither, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. He went on into the porch and the rooster crowed. The maid, the maid saw him and began again to tell those who stood by, this is one of them. But he again denied it, having a little, uh, a little while again, uh, after a little while again, those who stood by said to Peter, you truly are one of them, for you are a Galilean and your speech shows it. But he began to curse and to swear, I don't know this man of whom you speak. The rooster crowed the second time. Peter remembered the word, how that Jesus said to him before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. When he thought about that, he wept. And that concludes our reading of Matthew chapter 14. May God give you wisdom and spiritual revelation as we read these passages as we read this scripture and enlighten the eyes of your heart and your understanding to understand things you've never known before. So as you go and meditate on this word, may God bless you and may God be with you to teach you more of his will and his ways in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah. Thanks for watching.